What's up, guys? Welcome back. Another daily live stream. Hope you guys are uh, enjoying these quick chats. I'm kind of having fun. I've been getting a lot of good uh, feedback from them, so I appreciate you guys coming on and and sharing it and getting involved. Uh, you know, I want you guys to jump on. If you if you see the live stream come up, jump on, say hi, ask me some questions. I'm going to have a couple topics loaded. Um, but I do want you guys to uh, to get involved and be able to just kind of let me know if you have anything you want to talk about. You know, we can kind of discuss those. So the chat's open. Get on board and um, and start asking some questions and, and let's 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 talk together and um, let's have some fun. So uh, a lot of stuff's been going on and and I've been covering as much as I can on a broad spectrum of of uh, topics and you know I'm gonna try to blend it a little bit between ancient history and archaeology, some of the finds, uh, get into some of the, the science stuff, the space stuff, and also uh, some of this more uh, deeper philosophical and spiritual side too, which I think is really important because we want to have a, a nice rounded perspective of these topics and and because they, they do tie together, right? And they're all connected. So it gives us an opportunity um, to just kind of wrap our minds really quickly around a lot of different concepts. And and I think that's the whole, uh, uh, you know, purpose of the page here is to just remember, and also to uh, explore. So, uh, so thanks for for joining and and having fun with us. Uh, some interesting things again are going on in Egypt, and I find it pretty fascinating. Uh, but you know, we've heard stories of the Sphinx uh, having uh, uh, basically cavities in it. Uh, rooms and secret passages and uh, you know the, the Egypt really is kind of new if you think about it it wasn't until Napoleon came over with his armies and they they found the Sphinx buried and at that time it was just a head you know in the sand you've all seen these these pictures and and it was then when he also discovered the uh, Rosetta Stone and that was uh, the the first time they were able to actually uh, tap into the hieroglyphic language of ancient Egypt uh, because it had you know the the uh, uh, hieroglyphics decoded uh, into, you know, uh, Greek and and I believe uh, another language. I'm I'm not sure. I think Hebrew and then and then Greek or something like that. And so I was able to untap the language and bring Egypt to life. At the same time, the the Sphinx was just discovered and been sitting there and buried in sand. And and uh, what's fascinating about this period is that you have uh, characters that went in, and when they started uncovering this. The, the Sphinx complex, they noticed that, you know, there was a hole at the top of the, the Sphinx and they went in there and they explored and they did find caverns. And, and back then this was, you know, almost pre-archeological uh, era where you had, uh, you know, reports and uh, journalists going out there and describing these things. There was even a guy that went in there and mapped out these passages and, and drew them to find detail. So we have pretty good evidence, solid evidence that these passages did exist. Um, and for some reason, um, for, for interesting potential reasons, um, it was uh, covered up. And uh, it's my belief that, uh, you know, they found some, you know, there was some interesting information they wanted to kind of keep from people. And if you guys are into the Edgar Cayce uh, information, and he was a uh, basically kind of like a, just a regular old Joe that, that lived um, in the 19, you know, 10s, 20s, and 30s. And, and he was called the sleeping prophet. And he would basically lay down and go into this kind of meditative, deep meditative state. And, and he was able to access what, what he called the Akashic Records. And this is a, you know, a, a fancy name for essentially the, uh, the memory uh, bank or the, uh, uh, the essential, the non-physical library that all things that happen on earth um, are stored. So every single experience, every memory uh, that, that happens on, on every single, with every single person on the planet, he was able to tap into this and, uh, and find information and locate places and, and basically remote view himself into these, these places. And he actually did wrote, um, write about in some of these, um, uh, some of these sleeping, you know, meditative states, he actually went inside the Sphinx and, uh, and, and kind of confirmed some of the stuff that had been written in and, and uh, have mapped out, you know, 10, 15 years before that. So it's a really, really interesting mystery. And I think this uh, article kind of covers it pretty well. Um, and uh, they're saying that the head of the Sphinx, uh, interesting, 
uh, is one of the most fascinating things. Why, uh, why has it been discovered there's passages, but for some reason being kept away from the general public? What could these possible reasons be? In 1798, Napoleon Bonaparte's troops made an appearance in Egypt and they were surprised by the large buildings discovered. Um, uh, the Sphinx was half buried. Um, and once the world found out about it, you know, attention was drawn to it. It wasn't until 1936 that a, uh, a French um, researcher, uh, Emile Baguette, unearthed the magnificent structure and uh, it had been you know, basically covered up for thousands of years. Um, and then this is when about the same time that Casey um, started talking about the, he had visions of the, the internals of the Sphinx. And he said that there was a great ancient library that lied within the Great Sphinx that consisted of primitive knowledge regarding the findings of the ancient city of Atlantis. And, and I find this is fascinating because this we've talked about this on other podcasts, but there seems to be a connection um, between Egypt and Atlantis. And if you go to um, one of our earlier podcasts, we were we had Phil Harris, who runs the Ancient Esoteric and and uh, knowledge uh, Facebook page, which is an awesome spot. Um, we talk about Egypt being a colony of Atlantis. Egypt was, um, you know, basically a Western colony of, of the Atlantean Empire. And this is why we see these these massive, you know, buildings that had these high tech, you know, construction designs, and that seemed to uh, far advance, you know, anything in the area at the time. So, you know, if that's true, then the Sphinx would have been. Um, a part of that. And, and if you look at the Sphinx, the Sphinx is set in Robert Schock has done research showing that the Sphinx dates, you know, back to 12,000 BC and this uh, post Pleistocene period, uh, right after the Ice Age and maybe even before, because we, we noticed that water, you know, marks and, and uh, were on the side of it. it looked like there was a lot of rain. And so we know that we haven't had that type of climate uh, for quite some time. So even Robert Schock, I think he's at a Boston University professor and, and really, really amazing researcher. Uh, he pretty much concluded in the 90s, and, and I don't think he's had any uh, serious people uh, argue against his research, um, that they're, the Sphinx is an incredibly old structure, and, and it could even predate the, uh, the pyramids. <clears throat> so uh, there's some threads that are tied there between that um, you know, conventional science and some of these visions that were being uh, explored by Edgar Casey and this, this idea of ancient libraries. And then the mystery of why these guys aren't, you know, letting us know about this. And if you look today, um, you know, we, we see that there's actually a little concrete kind of thing at the, at the top of the Sphinx and so they sealed it. Um, and it's saying here that in 1987, a team from the Japanese university uh, discovered tunnels and cameras inside the Sphinx. This made the Egyptologist stagger, although it was later stated that such passages strangely did not lead anywhere. However, the truth is that the things did not end there. So here is some of the drawings that were done um, early on by uh, these first explorers. And this is probably barely when it was uncovered, it's probably still partially covered in sand. And you can see how there was you know, multiple passages that led down and the inside internal of the entire body of the Sphinx would have been uh, a sort of temple. Um, and then, of course, that would have also led further down into subterranean passages. And when we look at Giza, the plateau at large, we know that the entire Giza complex uh, had a system of caves and um, subterranean um, passages. So uh, there's, I believe, that the entire plateau um, was constructed all at once in, in one big pop. And they basically put a bunch of underground tunnels, underground passage systems, uh, probably temples and God knows what um, under the entire complex. So when you look at the entire area of Giza, just imagine a subterranean uh, landscape that that is uh, you know connecting everything together. And I think that's probably what we're looking at. Um, it's saying here that with the help of electromagnetic sound waves, the team discovered passages in the legs of the Sphinx as well as a cavity acting as a doorway in the head of the Sphinx. The cavity, which had been described by Napoleon, was photographed from the air at the beginning of the 20th century. However, the peculiar finding became uh, came to an end, blocking the passages and other cavities in the structural base, with the reason stating that the head of the Great Sphinx required restoration. Restoration, right? So sometime um, early on, they must have found something 
that uh, they wanted the public not to know about. And I think that this is where we start to begin this um, perpetuation. This is when they started deci making decisions on what they wanted the public to know about our ancient past. And I believe this is part of kind of this, this uh, sequestering of knowledge um, and uh, the beginning of kind of the indoctrinated version of our ancient history. So um, it's good that we're covering this. I want you to know that, that what we're told is not the truth. You know, they're giving us a preferred truth and um, all these mysteries, they, they point in one direction, you know, and so we, we need to look at that. Uh, the recreation that Charles Russell did in 1914 showed the inside of the Sphinx. In the illustration, the entrance to the Sphinx could be seen through the cavity of the head, which led to a chamber and down to the main room of the Sphinx. The main room uh, housed several passages that led to other areas outside the Sphinx and under it, a pyramid. It is believed that the Great Pyramid housed the Pharaoh of the first Egyptian dynasty, which would be uh, Pharaoh Menes, uh, and chosen by the gods to rule the earth, and who would have been represented on the face of the Great Sphinx. This news was also published in the British newspaper, uh, The Sphere, published on March 2nd, 1913, uh, where the same description provided by Charles Russell could be observed. But it was not the only publication that sold the finding in the media. A year later, on March 5th, 1914, the Australian newspaper Northern Territory published a column and an article detailing the discovery. So there is proof that these caverns uh, existed. We have you know, newspaper articles you can still find that are archived that you know, are detailed, they're actual reports, and then going in there and finding these things. So uh, very, very interesting. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and, and show you guys this. It's a good breakdown of kind of what happened. So um, check out some of this stuff. Bonaparte's troops arrived in Egypt and were amazed by the large buildings found there. Among them, there was the Great Sphinx showing its imposing imperialism before those men who missed that culture so different and extravagant. The Sphinx was half buried in the desert, but then the world was captivated by its charm. It was not until 1936 that the mission carried out by the French Emile Baguettes unearthed the great structure that had been covered by the sand path for millennia. A prophet of that time alerted the world declaring that he had had a vision under hypnosis in which he was inside the Sphinx of Egypt. In this was the great old library, which guarded ancient knowledge and, among them, the findings of Atlantis. According to Edgar the Prophet, the pyramids, the Sphinx and other buildings, are replicas of the submerged Atlantis. In 1987, a team from the Japanese University of Waseda discovered tunnels and cameras inside the Sphinx. This made the Egyptologist stagger, although later it was said that such passages, strangely, did not lead anywhere. But the truth is that the thing does not end here. The team found thanks to a study of electromagnetic sound waves, entries in the legs of the Sphinx, as well as a cavity in the same head of the Sphinx. This cavity, which had been described by Napoleon, was photographed from the air at the beginning of the 20th century. Although at the end, with reasons for the restoration of the head, the peculiar search was ended, blocking this and other cavities in the structural base. A recreation that Charles Russell did in 1914, showed the inside of the Sphinx. In the illustration, the entrance to the Sphinx could be seen through the cavity of the head, which led to a chamber and down to the main room of the Sphinx. This, in turn, housed several passages that led to other areas outside the Sphinx. And under it, a pyramid. A pyramid that would house the pharaoh of the first Egyptian dynasty, which would be Pharaoh Menes, chosen by the gods to rule on earth and who would have been represented on the face of the Great Sphinx. This news was also published on the cover a year earlier, in the British newspaper, The Sphere, published on March 22, 1913, where the same description as Charles Russell could be observed. But it was not the only publication that sold the finding in the media. A year later, on March 5, 1914, the Australian newspaper, Northern Territory Times, published a column in an article detailing the discovery. What do you think about this amazing discovery? Leave so it's pretty interesting. And um, I think this stuff is coming back to light. I think what's happening is this is kind of part of a disclosure. I think we're going, we're, we're seeing a lot of this in, in different areas of uh, the information that's being presented to us. And we have this space, you know, Mars potentially having life, water, volcanism, 
Um, you're starting to see things like, oh, well, maybe, the, you know, all of our ancient history is getting older. Uh, we're also starting to see that, oh, you know, these uh, buildings were constructed by, you know, more advanced technology. Uh, Atlantis seems to be coming back into the foreground. And, uh, and so I, I think that this is kind of a slow leak. We're going to see more of this stuff, try to cover it. Um, so I do want to move on. Um, and one, one thing that, um, that I'm really interested in, and you've heard us talk about with some other guests uh, uh, a lot, which is this idea of a, um, a blueprint, um, a cosmic blueprint that is uh, essentially like a field that has a uh, potential and that potential then is tapped um, uh, due to other re uh, any reasons. So basically you have the physical universe, uh, what we see and touch and smell, like all the biology of the earth is created by conditions which are present within that sphere. So um, let's say that, you know, the dinosaurs, they existed at a time whenever the elements on the planet um, were uh, in a condition to which they could exist. And so you have these potential templates in the fabric that then get expressed whenever the conditions in the physical universe uh, present themselves to be present, right? So, which would mean that that even though a comet could hit and destroy the dinosaurs and maybe change the entire, um, you know, uh, uh, the, the, it would change the, the degree of oxygen, nitrogen, and things like that in the atmosphere, that then settles and stabilizes and whatever uh, creatures and whatever form can then produce itself based on those, those elemental variants um, can then exist, right? So uh, with that same uh, idea, dinosaurs could very well return if the conditions uh, that allow them to exist, the nitrogen, oxygen levels, whatever it be, uh, came back and became present. And I think that you would see that happen. And this, this ties into the idea of rapid evolution, uh, instant evolution, where we, instead of us having this, um, this slow, long Darwinian type process, what we have is cataclysmic events that then uh, in other cosmic things like the earth moving into different areas of the galactic plane that, that change the, um, the, the way that the, uh, the earth uh, sets, whether it be an axis change, whether it be uh, you know, cosmic energy flowing in or the way that it affects the sun and how the sun's pumping energy to the earth. But all these different variants um, uh, basically program the Earth to express its biology in a certain way. And I think this is what's kind of happening. And this would also uh, make you think about different areas of the, the galaxy. And if you think about the galaxy as kind of like a map of the Earth, where like in Africa, certain animals exist because the weather is a certain way. And, and in colder environments, certain animals exist because the weather is a certain way. But we also have this galactic uh, type of um, geography in which in certain areas and regions of the galaxy itself, you're going to have planets that are able to express differently because they have a different kind of cosmic uh, weather. And so uh, I know that sounds crazy, but a lot of this stuff is backed up. And, and we are starting to, to provide uh, evidence of that um, based on this catastrophic and cataclysmic um, evolutionary science that's starting to come out, right? We know that dinosaurs ended in a cataclysm and whatever happened right after the dinosaurs, uh, it was due to that, the, the information that, that changed after the cataclysmic event. And, um, and if you're starting to look at Randall Carlson's research, we realize is that more often than not, we just keep getting pummeled. And when we look at Earth's history, a lot of these changes happened uh, with some kind of catastrophic or cataclysmic event. So this idea of morphic fields um, and this template of, of, uh, of consciousness or in, in information, if you want to call it, I'm more comfortable with that word, um, it's just kind of there and waiting for whatever condition uh, to stabilize. And then the biology then can immediately express itself and come into form. Um, so I think that's fascinating. Uh, what this is, this is saying is that the morphic fields of mental activity are not confined to the insides of our head. We are already familiar with the idea of fields extending beyond the material objects in which they are rooted. For example, magnetic fields extend beyond the surfaces of magnets. The Earth's gravitational field extends far beyond the surface of the Earth, keeping the moon in its orbit, and the fields of a cell phone stretch out far beyond the phone itself. Likewise, the fields of our minds extend beyond our brains. So um, on the microcosmic level, in terms of the human biology, we are basically in an eggshell 
of uh, uh, mental or intelligent energy, or you want to call it information, uh, that is then kind of manifesting the physical, and, and that's what's happening. Is you have this like vibratory type of manifestation of the physical uh, uh, form, right? And so that's what's happening. Now, when you scale out into the macro level, that's what's happening all the way in the galactic field, right? And so uh, we always we always have to remember that as as you know as above, so below, right? So these things kind of will map themselves out. So but we see this in biology with um, some of the uh, morphogenic uh, things in nature. Darwin's theory of evolution uh, is said incomplete. Evolution by random mutation is a slow and precarious process. Things like the leafy sea dragon or some of these um, uh, subterranean aquatic animals are able to change itself into protective camouflage. And we think, oh, well, that's just an evolutionary prototype for them to protect themselves. Um, but uh, it, it's not really that simple. Uh, we have things like the Indonesian mimic octopus, which can do 17 different life forms, right? So it can change into 17 different creatures um, just to adapt to whatever predator may be um, attacking it, right? So we can see this kind of octopus here and it's moving into like sea snakes and it mimics that. It can uh, mimic uh, things as a, a crinoids. Um, it can look like a sea star or a mantis shrimp. And, um, and of course that's its original form. So in a statistic, Darwin evolution can't do that. You know, that's not what it, the, what Darwinian evolution says is happening. So this is kind of a challenge to that. Um, and we don't see these fant uh, phantasmagorical intelligent series of transmor mor uh, mor uh, transmorphing into these different creatures. What, what it's starting to look like is that biology has a library of patterns or blueprints that it can then pull from, right? So it's connected to these patterns and these kind of template blueprints. And, and it can pull from that when it's needed. Um, a life form is a map of the forces or the morphogenic instructions that caused it to be. So this idea of a cosmic blueprint, which is an ancient one, Vedic philosophers consider everything as an internal essence informing its external appearance, um, which means that we're, we're really this uh, spiritual being that's, that's um, forming into this physical, right? We're, we're being created to a certain degree by our, our spiritual sense, our spiritual self. It's kind of um, solidifying the resonance, making it a, um, a more static uh, state, and that's what that's what our bodies are, right? Is this basically this uh, more concrete, you know, form of vibratory resonance, and, and we we identify with that physical, but really what we are is this kind of spiritual um, uh, spiritual being manifesting in the physical. So uh, the Rosicrucian Robert Flood said that there are other invisible writings secretly impressed on the leaves of nature's books being traced on the tablets of our hearts, these internal and spiritual characters, the interior writing may be the cause and origin of the things which do appear. So this is back in 1574, right? And these Rosicrucians, um, you know, they had access to these, some of these ancient scrolls, ancient knowledge. Um, and we've talked about that with some of the John Dee stuff. I mean, some of this stuff came from ancient libraries that go back further in time. And we know that what they, with the, the secret knowledge, right? The occult and, and esoteric knowledge that these guys are pulling from is stuff that now we're rediscovering and science is starting to have to come to terms with this, that this is more of a spiritual um, realm. It's not as physical as we like it to, to think it is. And they've kind of bottled that up. Um, so um, Robert Shel uh, Rupert Sheldrake is actually probably one of the best components of the modern idea of morphic resonance. I, you guys should definitely check him out. He's got some really good TED talk. He's also got some other information. Um, that essentially describes this cosmic blueprint type of idea. Uh, so go look him up, but he's suggesting a theory of morphic resonance, a vibrational archive of knowledge that intercommunicates ideas, strategies, and behaviors that each species has a specific timeless access to. He describes our bodies as nested hierarchies of vibrational frequencies, right? Uh, and you can see there in an ancient Sanskrit diagram, um, you know, you essentially have what he's describing right there, right? This kind of um, eggshell bubble of potential and these uh, meridians uh, in which energy is flowing in and out and our mental uh, awareness and our, our uh, um, more spiritual side is able to then, you know, kind of basically direct these flows of energies, right? And these chakra systems are kind of the, uh, the nexus points into which all of these things kind of flow and emanate from and they're just kind of centers of vortexes to where they're coming in and flowing out. 
This is also uh, what energy healers are dealing with when they're doing acupuncture uh, and things like that is that they're, they're tapping into these insert points, which there's energy meridians that are then kind of expressing and then kind of you know, coming in and pulling out. So, um, you know, again, this is this is this ties in all of this different type of knowledge. And and so when we think of things on a larger level, you know, we do have obviously um, the earth will have its own chakra like system. We'll have meridian lines called ley lines. And if you look at the research um, of where all these ancient structures and temples and, and things are, they actually lay on these meridian lines, which can be called essentially acupunctural uh, meridians of the earth. Right. And, and pyramids themselves tend to take that energy and vortex it up and or pull it down. So it's a way of, of pulling in cosmic energy and then um, redirecting it somewhere. So that's the idea behind that. Um, Sheldrake says that morphic fields of mental activity are not confined inside our heads. Uh, we just went through that. And, um, you know, when we when we at, when we apply this to experience. Right. This is the same the same thing that's going on whenever you say, oh, I thought about a person and he called me, or you have deja vu, or you have some type of vision that happens and, and it occurs. This is the uh, field in which you are experiencing those uh, realities, uh, dream states, um, any type of remote viewing, um, any type of uh, experience that you have that is you know, transphysical, um, that is a part of this actual you know um uh, uh uh plane that which you're experiencing on a daily basis so this isn't something that's just an imaginatory thing everyone experiences these things i mean every single person listening to this has had deja vu every single person's had lucid dreams or have um had experiences where they connect with people they think of something someone else uh says it at the same time or they think of a person they call them I mean, it happens to me on a weekly basis so i'm pretty sure it's pretty common for most of of you guys here. Um, and so what um, Sheldrake is kind of mapping out in, in his stuff is he's trying to basically tie it down and, and, and give it a, a good construction so that people can understand exactly how these things are, are working. He's saying that what a morphic field is, uh, it includes morphogenic, behavioral, social, cultural, and mental fields. So which means that you have these uh, scales, right? These variants of these fields, right? So a certain culture will have its own memory, it have its own field into which it can access the information to. Um, uh, and so that would scale in and scale out. So it's a very dimensional thing. Um, and they're saying that, that it is stabilized by morphic resonance from previous similar morphic units, which were under the influence of fields of the same kind. They consequently uh, contain a kind of culminative memory that tend to become increasingly habitual, right? So the more that the experiences continue to be rerouted the same exact way, then it solidifies that, that construct and then it can be you know, re-tapped into and re-expressed. Uh, morphic resonance um, form it is, is defined as uh, formative casual influences that pass through or across both space and time. These influences are assumed not to fall off with distance in space or time. Morphic units, uh, closely resemble themselves in the past and are subject to self resonance from their own past states. Um, so we have morphogenesis, the coming into being a form, and then morphogenic fields, which are fields that play a casual role in the morphogenesis process. So um, it's just giving you a kind of a scientific understanding of what these things are. And whenever you uh, think of someone, it doesn't matter whether your best friends in Hawaii, you, you think of them, it's eight hours behind or wherever it is, boom, they call you, right? It's three o'clock and where you're at and it's one in the morning there, it, it can travel, be, you know, space and time doesn't matter, right? These things are instant. And uh, what, what uh, Rupert Sheldrake is trying to do is, is map this out on more of a scientific level so we can you know, define it and understand it. And then uh, it may be even in the future, uh, not just become aware of it, but then learn how to manipulate it in a certain way so that we can um, you know, I guess, uh, access more potentials and more realities within our own self. And I think that's where we're headed, right? I mean, human, humankind is, is, is evolving to a degree. I think this is part of this process of us becoming more self-aware and, uh, and learning how to tap into these potentials. So hope you guys enjoyed that. Um, I will be back again, probably another a couple of days. Um, and um, let me know what you think. Go to the website, check out our material. Join the discussion group. Uh, keep us posted on what you guys want to hear about. I really appreciate you guys 
uh, joining, and I'm really having a lot of fun doing this, so uh, let me know what you think. Uh, I'll see you guys later.